Discussions about the First Opium War, part of the Fall of the Qing Dynasty series, part 5, section D. Technology and Tactics The British military superiority during the conflict drew heavily on the success of the Royal Navy. British warships carried more guns than their Chinese opponents and were maneuverable enough to evade Chinese boarding actions. Steamships such as the HMS Nemesis were able to move against winds and tides in Chinese waters and were armed with heavy guns and Congreve rockets. Several of the larger British ships in warships in China, notably the third rates HMS Cornwallis, HMS Wellesley, and HMS Melville, carried more guns than entire fleets of Chinese chunks. British naval superiority allowed the Royal Navy to attack Chinese forts with very little risk to themselves, as British naval cannons outranged the vast majority of the Qing artillery. British soldiers in China were equipped with Brunswick rifles and rifle-modified brown Bess muskets. Both of these types of rifles had an effective fighting range of 200 to 300 meters. British Marines were equipped with percussion caps that greatly reduced weapon misfires and allowed firearms to be used in damp environments. In terms of gunpowder, the British formula was better manufactured and contained more sulfur than the Chinese mixture. This granted British weapons an advantage in terms of range, accuracy, and projectile velocity. British artillery was lighter due to improved forging methods. The British artillery was also more maneuverable than the cannons used by the Chinese. As with the naval artillery, British guns outranged the Chinese cannons. In terms of tactics, the British forces in China followed doctrines established during the Napoleonic Wars that had been adapted during the various colonial wars of the 1820s and 1830s. Many of the British soldiers deployed to China were veterans of colonial wars in India and had experience fighting larger but technologically inferior armies. In battle, the British line infantry would advance toward the enemy in columns, forming ranks once they had closed to firing range. Companies would commence firing volleys into the enemy ranks until they retreated. If a position needed to be taken, an advance or charge with bayonets would be ordered. Light infantry companies screened the line infantry formations, protecting their flanks and utilizing skirmishing tactics to disrupt the enemy. British artillery was used to destroy the Qing artillery and break up enemy formations. During the conflict, the British superiority in range, rate of fire, and accuracy allowed the infantry to deal significant damage to their enemy before the Chinese could return fire. Congreve rockets were also a new technological advancement and proved to be very effective, especially against Chinese junks. Here is an image of a Royal Navy steamship destroying a Chinese junk with a Congreve rocket. Lightly armored Chinese warships were decimated by heavy guns and explosive weaponry. The use of naval artillery to support infantry operations allowed the British to take cities and forts with minimal casualties. The overall strategy of the British during the war was to inhibit the finances of the Qing Empire, with the ultimate goal of acquiring a colonial possession on the Chinese coast. This was accomplished through the capture of Chinese cities and by blockading major river systems. Once a fort or city had been captured, the British would 
destroy the local arsenal, and disable all of the captured guns. They would then move on to the next target, leaving a small garrison behind. This strategy was planned and implemented by Major General Go, who was able to operate with minimal input from the British government after Superintendent Elliot was recalled in 1841. The large number of private British merchants and East India Company ships deployed in Singapore and the India colonies ensured that the British forces in China were adequately supplied. Here is a painting of British line infantry advancing on a Chinese position. The Qing Dynasty forces. China did not have a unified navy. Although the Qing had invested in naval defenses for their adjacent seas in earlier periods, after the death of the Qianlong Emperor in 1799, the navy decayed as more attention was directed to suppressing the Miao Rebellion and White Lotus Rebellion, which left the Qing treasury bankrupt. This has been described in a previous documentary, The End of the Qing Dynasty, Part 2, The Internal, Internal Rebellions, Section A, The White Lotus and Eight Trigrams Rebellions. The remaining naval forces were badly overstretched, undermanned, underfunded, and uncoordinated. From the onset of war, the Chinese Navy was severely disadvantaged. Chinese war junks were intended for use against pirates or equivalent types of vessels, and were more effective in close-range river engagements. Due to their ship's slow speeds, Qing captains consistently found themselves sailing towards much more maneuverable British ships, and as a consequence, the Chinese could only use their bow guns. The size of the British ships made traditional boarding tactics useless, and the junks carried smaller numbers of inferior weaponry. In addition, the Chinese ships were poorly armored. In several battles, British shells and rockets penetrated Chinese magazines and detonated gunpowder stores. Highly maneuverable steamships, such as the HMS Nemesis, could decimate small fleets of junks, as the junks had little chance of catching up to and engaging the faster British steamers. The only Western-style warship in the Qing Navy, the converted East Indiaman Cambridge, was destroyed in the Battle of the First Bar. The defensive nature of the conflict resulted in the Chinese relying heavily on an extensive network of fortifications. The Kangxi Emperor, 1654 to 1722, began the construction of river defenses to combat pirates and encouraged the use of western style cannons. By the time of the First Opium War, multiple forts defended most major Chinese cities and waterways. Although the forts were well armed and strategically positioned, the Qing defeat exposed major flaws in their design. The cannons used in the Qing defensive fortifications were a collection of Chinese, Portuguese, Spanish, and British pieces. The domestically produced Chinese cannons were crafted using subpar forging methods, limiting their effectiveness in combat and causing excessive gun barrel wear. The Chinese blend of gunpowder contained more charcoal than the British mixture did. While this made the explosive more stable and thus easier to store, it also limited its potential as a propellant decreasing projectile range and accuracy. Overall, Chinese cannon technology was considered to be 200 years behind that of the British. <laughs>
Chinese forts were unable to withstand attacks by European weaponry, as they were designed without great angled glaciers, and many did not have protected magazines. The limited range of the Qing cannons allowed the British to bombard the Qing defenses from a safe distance, then land soldiers to storm them with minimal risk. Many of the larger Chinese guns were built as fixed emplacements and were unable to be moved to fire at British ships. The failure of the Qing fortifications, coupled with the Chinese underestimation of the Royal Navy, allowed the British to force their way up major rivers. and impede Qing logistics. Most notably, the powerful series of forts at Huben were well positioned to stop an invader from proceeding upriver to Canton, but it was not considered that an enemy would attack and destroy the forts themselves, as the British did during this war. At the start of the war, the Qing army consisted of over 200,000 soldiers, with around 800,000 men being able to be called on for war. These forces consisted of Manchu bannermen, the Green Standard Army, provincial militias, and imperial garrisons. The Qing armies were armed with matchlocks, and shotguns, which had an effective range of 100 meters. Chinese historians estimate 30 to 40 percent of the Qing forces were armed with firearms. Chinese soldiers were also equipped with halberds, spears, swords, and crossbows. The Qing Dynasty also employed large batteries of artillery in battle. The tactics of the Qing remained consistent with what they had been in previous centuries. Soldiers with firearms would form ranks and fire volleys into the enemy, while men armed with spears and pikes would drive something called, described by the Chinese as tui, push, the enemy off the battlefield. Cavalry was used to break infantry formations and pursue routed enemies, while Qing artillery was used to scatter enemy formations and destroy fortifications. During the First Opium War, these tactics were unable to successfully deal with British firepower. Chinese formations were decimated by artillery and Chinese soldiers armed with matchlocks could not effectively exchange fire with British ranks, who greatly outranged them. Most battles of the war were fought in cities or on cliffs and riverbanks, limiting the usage of cavalry. Many Qing cannons were destroyed by the British counter-battery fire, and British light infantry companies were consistently able to outflank and capture Chinese artillery batteries. A British officer said of the opposing Qing forces, the Chinese are robust muscular fellows and no cowards. The Tartars, Manchus, desperate. But neither are well commanded nor acquainted with European warfare. Having had, however, experience of three of them, I am inclined to suppose that a Tartar bullet is not a whit softer than a French one. The strategy of the Qing Dynasty during the war was to prevent the British from seizing Chinese territory. This defensive strategy was hampered by the Qing severely underestimating the capacity of the British military. Qing defenses on the Pearl and Yangtze rivers were ineffective in stopping the British push inland, and superior naval artillery 
prevented the Chinese from retaking the cities. The Qing imperial bureaucracy was unable to react quickly to the prodding British attacks, while officials and commanders often reported false, faulty, or incomplete information to their superiors. The Qing military system made it difficult to deploy troops to counter the mobile British forces. In addition, the ongoing conflict with Sikhs on the Qing border with India drew away some of the most experienced Qing units from the war with Britain. Here is an image of Chinese soldiers armed with a gingal during the First Opium War. Here is a painting of a battle between Qing matchlock armed infantry and British line infantry at the Battle of Qingqiang. The retreat of the Qing infantry into the city and the ensuing close quarters combat led to heavy casualties on both sides. Aftermath The war ended in the signing of China's first unequal treaty, the Treaty of Nanking. The Treaty of Nanking The first working draft of a treaty was prepared at the Foreign Office in London in February 1840. The Foreign Office was aware that preparing a treaty containing Chinese and English characters would need special consideration. Given the distance separating the countries, it was realized that some flexibility and a departure from established procedure in preparing treaties might be required. Foreign Trade The fundamental purpose of the treaty was to change the framework of foreign trade imposed by the Canton system. This had been in force since 1760. Article 1. There shall henceforward be peace and friendship between Her Majesty the Queen of the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Ireland and His Majesty the Emperor of China and between their respective subjects who shall enjoy full security and protection for the persons within the dominions of the other. Article 2. Foreign merchants were to be allowed to trade with anyone they wished in designated treaty ports. Britain also gained the right to send consuls to the treaty ports, and these consuls were given the right to directly communicate with local Chinese officials. Article 3. It being necessary and desirable that British subjects should have some port whereat they may careen and refit their ships when required and keep stores for that purpose. His Majesty the Emperor of China cedes to Her Majesty the Queen of Great Britain the island of Hong Kong to be possessed in perpetuity by Her Britannic Majesty, her heirs and successors, and to be governed by such laws and regulations as Her Majesty the Queen of Great Britain shall see fit to direct. Article 4. The Qing government was obliged to pay the British government six million dollars equivalent for the opium that had been confiscated by Lin Zexu in 1839. Article 5. The treaty abolished the former monopoly of the Cohong and their 13 factories in Canton. Four additional treaty ports opened for foreign trade alongside Canton. Amoy, which was Jiamen until 1930, Fuchao Fu or Fuzhou, Ningpo or Ningbo, and Shanghai until 1943. Shamin Island was added in 1843. Also in Article 5, three million dollars was to be paid in compensation for debts that the merchants in Canton owed British merchants. Article 6, a further 22 million dollars was to be paid to the British government for the cost of the war. 
Article 7. The total sum of $20 million was to be paid in installments over three years, and the Qing government would be charged an annual interest rate of 4% for the money that was not paid in a timely manner. Article 8. The Qing government undertook to release all British prisoners of war. Article 9. The Qing government was to give a general amnesty to all Chinese subjects who had cooperated with the British during the war. Article 10. The treaty stipulated that trade in the treaty ports should be subject to fixed tariffs. These were to be agreed upon between the British and the Qing government. Article 11. It is agreed that Her Britannic Majesty's Chief High Officer in China shall correspond with the Chinese High Officer both at the capital and in the provinces under the term communication. The subordinate British officers and Chinese High Officers in the province under the terms statement and on the part of the former and part of the latter declaration and the subordinates of both countries on a footing of perfect equality. Merchants and others not holding official situations and therefore not included in the above on both sides to the term representation in all pages addressed to or intended for the notice of their representative governments. Article 12. The British on their part undertook to withdraw all of their troops from Nanking, the Grand Canal, and the military post at Zhenhai, as well as not to interfere with China trade generally. This was after the Emperor had given his assent to the treaty and the first installment of money had been received. British troops would remain in Shan and Gulan Yu until the Qing government had paid reparation in full. Article 13. The ratification of the treaty by Her Majesty the Queen of Great Britain and His Majesty the Emperor of China shall be exchanged as soon as the great distance which separate England and China will admit. But in the meantime, counterpart copies of it signed and sealed by the plenipotentiaries on behalf of their respective sovereigns shall be mutually delivered and all of its provisions and arrangements shall take effect. Done at Nanking and signed and sealed on board Her Britannic Majesty's ship Cornwallis this 29th day of August 1842 corresponding with the Chinese date, 24th day of the 7th month in the 22nd year of Tao Kuan, or Tao Kuan. Session of Hong Kong. In 1841, a rough outline for a treaty was sent for the guidance of plenipotentiary Charles Eliot. It had a blank after the words, the session of the islands of. Pottinger sent this old draft treaty on shore with the letters S struck out of islands and the words Hong Kong placed after it. Robin Montgomery Martin, treasurer of Hong Kong, wrote in an official report the terms of peace having been read, Elipu, the senior commissioner, paused, expecting something more, and at length said, Is that all? Mr. Morrison inquired of Lieutenant Colonel Malcolm, Pottinger's secretary, if there was anything else, and being answered in the negative, Elipu immediately and with great tact closed the negotiation by saying, All shall be granted. It is settled. It is finished.
the Qing government agreed to make Hong Kong Island a crown colony, ceding it to British Queen Victoria for a lengthy period to provide British traders with a harbor where they could careen and refit their ships and keep stores for that purpose. This was in Article 3. Pottinger was later appointed the first governor of Hong Kong. In 1860, the colony was extended with the addition of the Kowloon Peninsula. In 1898, the Second Convention of Peking further expanded the colony with the 99-year lease of the new territories. In 1984, the governments of the United Kingdom and the People's Republic of China concluded the Sino-British Joint Declaration on the question of Hong Kong. Maggie Thatcher tried to save Hong Kong's independence. Under this agreement, the sovereignty of the least territories, together with Hong Kong Island and Kowloon, south of Boundary Street, ceded under the Convention of Peking in 1860, was transferred to the PRC on July 1st, 1997. The Treaty of Nanking was sealed by interpreter John Robert Morrison for the British and Wang Ta-jin for the Chinese. Harry Parks, who was a student under Morrison, gave his account of the ceremony. There were four copies of the treaty signed and sealed. They were bound in worked yellow silk. One treaty in English and the same in Chinese, stitched and bound together, formed a copy. This being finished, they all came down, came out of the after cabin and sat down to tiffin. And the different officers seated themselves all round the table, making plenty of guests. Almost directly after the treaty was signed, a yellow flag for China at the main and a Union Jack for England at the mizzen were hoisted and at the same time a royal salute of 21 guns was fired. The Daoguang Emperor gave his assent for the treaty on September 8th. After his assent arrived in Nanking on September 15th, Pottinger's secretary, George Alexander Malcolm, was dispatched on board the steamer Auckland the next morning to the court of St. James in London with a copy for ratification by Queen Victoria. The Emperor ratified the treaty on October 27th and Queen Victoria added her own assent on December 28th. Ratification was exchanged in Hong Kong on June 26th, 1843. Pottinger wrote a letter to the Earl of Aberdeen the following year that, at a feast with Qi Ying celebrating the ratification, Qi Ying insisted, they ceremonially, ceremonially exchange miniature portraits of each member of each other's families. Upon receiving a miniature portrait of Pottinger's wife, Pottinger wrote that Qi Ying placed the miniature on his head, which I am told is the highest token of respect and friendship. Filled a glass of wine, again placed the picture on his head, and then sat down to complete the ceremony of long-term amity between the two families and the two peoples. This extravagant display has been analyzed as showing an emotionally charged reciprocity in this symbolic gesture of swapping images of wives. Because of the brevity of the Treaty of Nanking and its terms being 
phrased only as stipulations, the British and Chinese representatives agreed that a supplementary treaty should be concluded to establish more detailed regulations for relations. On October 3, 1843, the parties concluded the supplementary Treaty of the Bogue at the Boga Tigris outside Canton. It also had China recognize Britain as an equal. Nevertheless, the treaties of 1842 to 43 left several unsettled issues. In particular, they did not resolve the status of the opium traffic in favor of the British Empire. Although the Treaty of Wangia with the Americans and the Treaty of Wampoa with the French in 1844 explicitly banned Americans from selling opium, the trade continued as both the British and American merchants were only subject to the legal control of their permissive consuls. The opium traffic was later legalized in the treaties of Tianjin, which China concluded after the Second Opium War resulted in another defeat for the Qing Dynasty. The Nanking Treaty ended the old Canton system and created a new disadvantageous framework for China's foreign relations and overseas trade. This would last for almost 100 years and mark the start of China's century of humiliation at the hands of foreign powers. From the Chinese perspective, the most injurious terms were the fixed trade tariff, extraterritoriality, the most favored nation provisions, and the forced importation of British opium, which continued to have devastating social and economic consequences for the Chinese people. These exploitative terms were imposed by the British from a position of power after her military victories and were conceded by the Qing dynasty in order to avert continued military defeats. The tariff, fixed at 5%, was higher than before, while the concept of extraterritoriality seemed to put the burden on foreigners to police themselves. In addition, the most favored nation treatment appeared to set the foreigners against each other. Although China regained tariff autonomy in the 1920s, extraterritoriality was not formally abolished until the 1943 Sino-British Treaty for the Relinquishment of Extraterritorial Rights in China. Legacy and Memory Here is the entrance to the Opium War Museum in Hunan Tao, Guangdong, China. The opium trade faced intense enmity from the later British Prime Minister William Ewart Gladstone. As a member of Parliament, Gladstone called it most infamous and atrocious, referring to the opium trade between China and British India in particular. Gladstone was fiercely against both of the opium wars Britain waged in China. The first opium war initiated in 1839 and the second opium war initiated in 1857. He denounced British violence against the Chinese and was ardently opposed to the British trade in opium in China. Gladstone made a famous speech in Parliament against the First Opium War. Gladstone criticized it as a war more unjust in origin, a war more calculated in its progress to cover this country with permanent disgrace. His hostility to opium stemmed from the effects opium brought upon his sister, Helen. Due to the First Opium War, brought on by Palmerston, 
there was initial reluctance to join the government of Peel on part of Gladstone before 1841. The war marked the start of what 20th century Chinese nationalists called the century of humiliation. The ease with which British forces defeated the numerically superior Chinese armies damaged the Qing dynasty's prestige. The Treaty of Nanking was a step to opening the lucrative Chinese market to global commerce and the opium trade. The interpretation of the war, which was long the standard in the People's Republic of China, was summarized in 1976. The Opium War, in which the Chinese people fought against British aggression, marked the beginning of modern Chinese history and the start of the Chinese bourgeois democratic revolution against imperialism and feudalism. The Treaty of Nanking, the Supplementary Treaty of the Bogue, and the American and French agreements were all unequal treaties signed between 1842 and 1844. The terms of these treaties undermined China's traditional mechanisms of foreign relations and methods of controlled trade. Five ports were opened for trade, gunboats, and foreign residents. These were Guangzhou, Jiamen, Fuzhou, Ningbo, and Shanghai. A couple of years after the treaties were signed, the continuation of internal rebellions throughout China due to resentment and hatred between the Qing dynasty and the Han, Hui, Dungan, and Hakka peoples began to threaten foreign trade. Due to the Qing government's inability to control the collection of taxes on imported goods, the British government convinced the Manchu court to allow Westerners to partake in government official affairs. By the 1850s, the Chinese Maritime Customs Service, one of the most important bureaucracies in the Manchu government, was partially staffed and managed by Western foreigners. In 1858, opium was legalized and would remain a problem. Commissioner Lin, often referred to as Lin of the Clear Sky for his moral probity, was made a scapegoat. He was blamed for ultimately failing to stem the tide of opium imports and usage, as well as for provoking an unwinnable war through his rigidity and lack of understanding of the changing world. Nevertheless, as the Chinese nation formed in the 20th century, Lin became viewed as a hero and has been immortalized at various locations around China. The First Opium War both reflected and contributed to a further weakening of the Chinese state's power and legitimacy. Anti-Qing sentiment grew in the form of rebellions, which were already happening for several decades prior to the British conflicts. The Taiping Rebellion, a war lasting from 1850 to 1864, in which 20 million, by some estimates, and as much as 70 million by others happened at the same time as the Opium Wars. This has been described before in a previous documentary. The End of the Qing Dynasty, Part 2, The Eternal Rebellions, Section B, The Taiping Rebellion. The decline of the Qing Dynasty was beginning to be felt by much of the Chinese population. Revisionist views. The evil impact of the opium habit on the Chinese people and the arrogant manner in which the British imposed their superior power to guarantee the profitable trade had been the staples of Chinese historiography ever since.
One British historian, Jasper Ridley, concluded, Conflict between China and Britain was inevitable. On the one side was a corrupt, decadent, and castle-ridden despotism, with no desire or ability to, change, to wage war, which relied upon custom much more than force for the enforcement of extreme privilege and discrimination, and which was blinded by a deep-rooted superiority complex into believing that they could assert their supremacy over Europeans without possessing military power. On the other side was the most economically advanced nation in the world, a nation of pushing, bustling traders, of self-help, free trade, and the pugnacious qualities of John Bull. However, with the ads, opposition in Britain was intense. An entirely opposite British viewpoint was promoted by humanitarians and reformers, such as the Chartists and the religious nonconformists, led by a young William Ewart Gladstone. They argued that Palmerston, the Foreign Secretary, was only interested in the huge profits it would bring Britain, and it was totally oblivious to the horrible moral evils of opium, which the Chinese government was valiantly trying to stamp out. The American historian John K. Fairbank wrote, In demanding diplomatic equality and commercial opportunity, Britain represented all the Western states, which would sooner or later have demanded the same thing if Britain had not. It was an accident of history that the dynamic British commercial interests in the China trade were centered not only on tea, but also on opium. If the main Chinese demand had continued to be for Indian raw cotton, or, any, or at any rate, if there had been no market for opium in late Qing China, as there had been none earlier, then there would have been no opium war. Yet, probably some kind of Sino-Foreign War would have come, given the irresistible vigor of Western expansion and the immovable inertia of Chinese institutions. Some historians claim that Lord Palmerston, the British Foreign Secretary, initiated the Opium War to maintain the principle of free trade. Professor Glenn Melanson, for example, argues that the issue in going to war was not opium, but Britain's need to uphold its reputation, its honor, and its commitment to global free trade. China was pressing Britain just when the British faced serious pressures in the Near East, on the Indian frontier, and in Latin America. In the end, says Melanson, the government need to maintain its honor in Britain and prestige abroad forced the decision to go to war. Former American President John Quincy Adams commented that opium was a mere incident to the dispute. The cause of the war is the kowtow, the arrogant and unsupportable pretensions of China that she will hold commercial intercourse with the rest of mankind, not upon the terms of equal reciprocity, but upon the insulting and degrading forms of the relations between lord and vassal. Australian historian Harry G. Gelber argues that opium played a role similar to the tea dumped into the harbor in the Boston Tea Party of 1773, leading to the American Revolutionary War. Gelber argues instead that the British went to war because of Chinese military threats to defenseless British civilians, including women and children, 
because China refused to negotiate on terms of diplomatic equality and because China refused to open more ports than Canton to trade, not just with Britain, but with everybody. The belief about British guilt came later as part of China's long catalog of alleged Western exploitation and aggression. Western women were not legally permitted to enter China in the first place. Into the 19th century, Western nations did not recognize diplomatic equality for entities that failed to meet their standard of civilization, including China. The policy of restricting trade to a single port was also used in Western countries such as Spain and Portugal. Western merchants could also trade freely and legally with Chinese merchants in Xiamen and Macau or when the trade was conducted through ports outside China such as Manila and Batavia. The public in Western countries had earlier condemned the British government for supporting the opium trade. By 1850, opium smuggling to China accounted for up to 20% of the revenue of the British Empire, serving as the most profitable single commodity trade of the 19th century. As Timothy Brook and Bob Wakabayashi wrote of opium, the British Empire could not survive were it deprived of its most important source of capital, the substance that could turn any other commodity into silver. Chinese merchants were actually banned by Qing law from suing foreigners in Chinese courts, as a Qianlong emperor believed that good treatment of foreigners was essential for the government. The mistreatment of foreigners had been a major cause of the overthrow of several earlier dynasties. Tax was exempted on food, drink, and basic supplies for Western merchants, and protections were granted to Westerners and their property. The Qianlong Emperor granted Lord McCartney's a uh, golden scepter, an important symbol of peace and wealth. But this was dismissed by the British as worthless. In 1806, China's officials compromised with the British on the murder of a Chinese man by British seamen, as Westerners refused to be punished under Chinese law, and local citizens vigorously protested what they considered a miscarriage of justice, and just out of xenophobia. In 1816, the Zhao Qing Emperor dismissed a British embassy for their refusal to kowtow, but he sent them a long, rude, condescending, apologetic letter with gifts. The British simply discarded them without reading. The British, on the other hand, ignored Chinese laws and warnings not to deploy military forces in Chinese waters. The British landed troops in Macau, despite a Chinese and Portuguese agreement to bar foreign forces from Macau. Then, in the War of 1812, British ships attacked American ships deep in the inner harbor of Canton. The Americans had previously robbed British ships in Chinese waters as well. These, in combination with the British support to Nepal during the Qing invasions of Tibet and later the British invasion of Nepal after it became a Chinese tributary state, led the Chinese authorities to become highly suspicious of British intentions. In 1834, 
when British naval vessels intruded into Chinese waters again, the Daoguang Emperor commented, How laughable and deplorable is it that we cannot even repel two barbarian ships. Our military has decayed so much. No wonder the barbarians are looking down on us. Was the war inevitable? Historians have often pondered whether the war could have been avoided. One factor was that China rejected diplomatic relations with Britain or anyone else, as seen in the rejection of the McCartney mission in 1793. As a result, diplomatic mechanisms for negotiation and resolution were missing. Michael Greenberg locates the inevitable cause in the momentum for more and more overseas trade in Britain's expanding modern economy. On the other hand, the economic forces inside Britain that were war hawks, radicals in Parliament, and northern merchants and manufacturers were a political minority and needed allies, especially Palmerston, before they could get their war. In Parliament, the Melbourne government faced a host of complex international threats including the Chartist riots at home, bothersome budget deficits, unrest in Ireland, rebellions in Canada and Jamaica, war in Afghanistan, and French threats to British business interests in Mexico and Argentina. Some revisionists claim that the opposition demanded more aggressive answers, and it was Foreign Minister Palmerston, who set up an easy war to solve the political crisis. This statement is absurd, in that the opposition, led by William Gladstone, was very much against the war. For Palmerston, there was no way to know beforehand that a war with China would be easy, and it wasn't for those who fought it was not economics or opium sales or expanding trade that caused the British to go to war, according to Melanson. It was more a matter of upholding aristocratic standards of national honor sullied by Chinese insults. One historical problem is the emphasis on the British causal factors tends to ignore the Chinese. The Manchu rulers were focused on internal unrest by Chinese elements and paid little attention to the minor issues happening in Canton. Historian James Polachek argues the reasons for trying to suppress the opium trade had to do with internal factionalism led by a purification oriented group of literary scholars who paid no attention to the risk of international intervention by much more powerful military forces. Therefore, it was not a matter of inevitable conflict between contrasting worldviews. The historian Jonathan Spence commented that Lin and the Daoguang Emperor seemed to have believed that the citizens of Canton and the foreign traders there had simple childlike natures that would respond to firm guidance and statements of moral principles set out in simple, clear terms. Neither considered the possibility that the British government would be committed to protecting the smugglers. Polacek argues, based on records of court debate, that growing court awareness that opium addiction in the Guangdong military garrisons caused by widespread collusion between British smugglers and Chinese officials had completely impaired their military effectiveness. This left the 
the entire southern flank of the chain exposed to military threats and was more important in generating opposition to the drug trade than economic reasons. Polochek shows that Lin Zexu and the hardliners mistakenly believed that by arresting drug abusers, confiscating the opium supplies, and promising to allow the British to continue trading in other goods, they could persuade the British to give up the drug trade without a war. William Jardine Taipan, or iron-headed old rat, who was the driving force in provoking the war, returned to China. For Jardine, Hong Kong was the ultimate prize. It was the culmination of his many years of hard labor. Once it had been officially ceded to Britain, he and Matheson quickly set to work, turning the bleak rock into the greatest colonial trading port of the East. It was not a smooth transition, as typhoons and fires sabotaged the early construction. Malaria ravaged settlers, and seaborne piracy was rampant. Nevertheless, the Scottish partners pushed on, continuing to be major promoters of the struggling island. Matheson established the company's new head office on the island's East Point in 1842, while warehouses, wharves, and houses were built to accommodate the firm's business operations and employees. Hong Kong quickly turned into a boom town, doubling its population from 7,000 to 15,000 within its first year. While it would be untrue to say that Jardine Matheson and company were the sole driving force behind Hong Kong's success, it is unlikely that the tiny colony would have become the blooming city it is today without the investment of the Scottish drug lords. At some point in 1842, William Jardine became afflicted with cancer. He continued to run his trading empire through his sickness, but on February 27, 1843, the great Tai Pan passed away at the age of 59. The crown colony of Hong Kong continued to flourish, especially as a center for a newly resurgent opium trade, which the Chinese were now doubly helpless to stop. Following Jardine's death, the business was controlled at first by James Matheson and later by their descendants. As the fragrant harbor evolved from a colonial frontier post into one of the world's most bustling trade cities, the descendants of William Jardine were always there at the center of it all. Each of them bore the title of Taipan, as their ancestor had. Today, Jardine Matheson Holdings Limited is Hong Kong's largest private employer, second only to the government. A worldwide corporation, it has subsidiaries in cars, insurance, real estate, hygiene products, and hotels, among other businesses. From these high achievements, we must not forget the humble origins and troubled history of Jardine Matheson, which ultimately is the story of a peasant boy in the Scottish lowlands, whose endless ambition saw him slowly become one of the most famous drug lords of all time, and in doing so, forever changing the face of the Chinese world.